I spend much of my time teaching people about the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms and how judges, the Supreme Court, and others have interpreted over the years and how it should be interpreted based on Supreme Court precedent and, of course, the text of the Second Amendment itself and how it falls within the structure of the overall Constitution. Today, I just want to give you a general outline about how to think about Supreme Court cases is a big picture categorization way, which I think will help you explain to other people how to think about the right to keep and bear arms and how to explain it in terms of the various buckets into which cases fall. I think this video will be helpful. We're going to step back, look at the big picture here for a second, because again, sometimes to go fast, we have to go slow. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarm, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, folks, so when we talk about the right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment, sometimes it's good to step back and just kind of see big picture where the right stands in American life today. Now, obviously, it's a fundamental right recognized by throughout history uh, and also by the U.S. Supreme Court repeatedly. It is obviously a fundamental right. That's why it falls within the Bill of Rights. The most important rights were enshrined by our founding fathers in 1791 when the ratification of the Bill of Rights occurred. And, of course, um, it's very important to recognize that the Second Amendment recognizes a pre-existing right. The Second Amendment does not create the right to keep and bear arms. It recognizes that right that existed before the enactment of the Constitution and the enactment of the Bill of Rights. Now, with that said, we talk a lot about different cases. We have a lot of issues that we cover involving the Second Amendment, the text of the Second Amendment, the history surrounding the Second Amendment, proposed gun control laws by the anti-gun community in America. So I thought it might be helpful to step back and just give you a big picture approach to how I think about these cases, because it's sometimes very helpful in your mind to organize where particular cases fall in terms of the big picture. It also, I think, help, may help you to explain to your friends at the gun club, uh, at the bar, at the restaurant, your, your, your kids, your parents, whomever, about how to think about the Second Amendment right and where particular cases fall into the big picture. Again, the questions that you learn in grammar school, it's kind of like how you write an essay or how you write a news story. It's whether, it's where, it's who, it's what, it's how. You know, those basic questions uh, that we ask questions about the world in which we live. So with that said, let's just walk through where Second Amendment litigation stands in America today and the buckets into which these various cases fall. To begin with, the first question, of course, is whether we as Americans have a right to keep and bear arms at all. Well, obviously we do, not just because of the text of the Second Amendment, but because the Supreme Court has also recognized that that's exactly what the Second Amendment protects. It prevents the government from taking away our pre-existing right to keep and bear arms. So whether we have a right had to first and foremost finally be resolved by the U.S. Supreme Court in the District of Columbia versus Heller case in 2008. So whether or not we have a right to keep and bear arms, it's an individual right, that's a fundamental right, and so on, that is an undeniable yes. Uh, it is a right to keep and bear arms, and it is fundamental. That was recognized in the Heller case in 2008, and of course reaffirmed in 2010 in the McDonald versus Chicago case. So the whether we have a right has been answered in the yes. That's the first thing. But let us carry on. The next question is, uh, where does that right extend? So now we go from whether we have the right to where we have that right, where we have the right. And that is resolved by both Heller and Bruin. The where we can exercise the right to keep and bear arms was addressed in Heller, specifically saying that we have the right to keep and bear arms in the home. Because remember, the District of Columbia law that was challenged and struck down as unconstitutional in the Heller case dealt with whether or not you could have a loaded, unlocked handgun in the home. So the where we're allowed to exercise the right to keep and bear arms in Heller resolved, you certainly can have a right to keep and bear arms in your home. Then, of course, in 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court then took that a step further as well it should have and made the correct decision that says the where you have the right to keep and bear arms also extends outside of the home when they decide the Nicerpa versus Bruin case, which said that you have a right to keep and bear arms outside the home in public. So again, the where you have the right to keep and bear arms, Heller's, you have the right in the home, Bruin, you have the right to care, keep and bear arms in public. Now there's an asterisk here, which I flagged even before 
the Bruin case was decided, which we have this major fight about the euphemism sensitive places, which is a euphemism for government mandated gun free zones. And of course, those litigations are ongoing and fighting. And again, the way to think about those sensitive places fights is it's the where issue. So again, the whether we have a right is the Heller case, the where we have the right and where we can exercise that right is Heller and Bruin with the asterisk that the sensitive places fight, government mandated gun free zones fight is continuing on right now. That too falls under the where we can exercise the right to keep your arms. So now we've done the weather, now we've done the where. Let's move on to the what. What are we allowed to have? What does the Second Amendment protect? We know that because the text tells us the right of the people to keep and bear arms right, shall not be infringed. So arms are obviously the what where uh, we have the right to as American citizens and the Second Amendment codifies that pre-existing right to have arms. So what are arms? Not everything is an arm because obviously definitionally something may be a camera, something may be a fish, something may be a cat, something may be an arms. So we want to know where these things, what these things are and what these things are not because part of a definition of an object includes not just what it is, it also includes what it is not. So what exactly is an arms in the context of the text of the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed? Well, the Supreme Court has addressed this to a great degree already. For the purposes of the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court says that arms are anything that can be used offensively or defensively. That's exactly right. The definition of arms using 18th century lexicographers, including Samuel Johnson and Noah Webster, the American English, the American who wrote the Dictionary of English, uh, they both say together that the that arms includes anything that can be used offensively or defensively, including, by the way, body armor. But that's a different issue. Now, the Supreme Court has also clarified that in the context of the Second Amendment, obviously the arms that are protected are those arms that are bearable, the right to keep and bear arms presupposes that you can bear arms, which means you can carry arms. And then under certain arguments involving the Second Amendment, certainly I think the current Supreme Court would agree, for example, the right to keep and bear arms does not extend to, let's say, a nuclear submarine because you cannot carry a nuclear submarine and thus it's not a bearable arm. So if you want to be precise about that, the arms that are protected according to the U.S. Supreme Court under the Second Amendment includes those arms that are bearable. Anything that can be carried as an arm is undeniably a protected arm under the con under the text of the Second Amendment. But so that's the what. So we've done the whether you have the right, the where you can exercise that right, and the what that right entails, which of course includes anything that can be used offensively or defensively as an arm, and those specifically that are bearable arms, meaning that you can carry arms are protected by the Second Amendment. So now let's go on to the who. Who exactly uh, is has the right to keep and bear arms? Now at a big picture level. We know that all Americans are part of the people because the phrase the people appears in several different aspects of the Bill of Rights. The word the people appears in the First Amendment dealing with free speech and free exercise of religion and so on. So the people's in the First Amendment, the people's in the Second Amendment, the people's in the Fourth Amendment, which deals with criminal procedural protections like uh, being free from warrantless searches and seizures and unreasonable searches and seizures and the like. So at a definitional level in the text, the who constitutes the people that have the right of the people to keep and bear arms includes all Americans. With that said, at the historical level, we know there are certain fights going on about who can be disarmed under the historical tradition going back to 1791. And this gets into what I call the issues associated with the Range case, which is the Brian Range versus Merrick Garland case uh, that he won in the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit out of Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Delaware, and also the Rahimi case, which deals with the United States versus Rahimi case that it deals with the interpretation of that federal gun control statute dealing with prohibited persons, 18 U.S.C. 922G. 
So again, the who question is who can be disarmed. We know that all the people have the right to keep marriage because that's how it's defined in the Constitution. But to the extent anyone can be disarmed because, for example, they're a violent danger and can be locked up as a criminal for the rest of their lives because they murdered 17 people or something. Well, again, those are questions that are presented right now by the pending cases of Rahimi before the U.S. Supreme Court and possibly Brian Range before the Supreme Court. That's up on a cert petition. We'll see what happens. So again, the Range and Rahimi type cases and also the cases that deal with whether or not if you are a user, a periodic user or user of, uh, let's say, medicinal marijuana, whether or not under 18 U.S.C. 922 G, you can be barred from uh, or disarmed or prevented from having guns or possessing firearms because you use marijuana. That would be another set of cases uh, that we see. So again, Rahimi, Range, and the marijuana cases all fall under the WHO has the right to keep marijuana and who can be disarmed, okay? So the last category I think that you should just be aware of as you put these things in your mind as to little buckets, the way I view these is, you know, you got the weather bucket, the where bucket, the what bucket, the who bucket, and now the how use bucket. This is a bucket that has not been nearly talked about enough. And I think we need to start talking about it because this is where the anti gunners are going to try to go. This is something that we should talk more about and we're going to starting now, which is called the how bucket. The how bucket or the how you use bucket. Now, what do I mean by that? If you just think big picture, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed is utterly and meaning is utterly meaningless to Americans if you cannot use your right to keep and bear arms to defeat or thwart tyranny in all its forms. Now, that form of tyranny, as understood by the founding fathers, including, for example, Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, who talks about the importance of the Second Amendment or the right, the, you know, an armed citizen being a palladium of a free republic and these kinds of things in his early commentary on the U.S. Supreme Court and the Constitution, Joseph Story. He obviously is a very famous person because if you ever watch the Amistad movie by Steven Spielberg, that famous justice that issued the decision that said that the African-American, the African slaves that were enslaved by the Spaniards on the ship and that mutinied and basically uh, beat up the Spaniards and kicked them to the side, uh, they were free men under, uh, you know, that was the interpretation of uh, Joseph Story, U.S. Supreme Court Justice. He's the same one that says they're an armed citizenry is the palladium uh, of a free republic. Very good on the Second Amendment, very important historical justice. You may want to look up Joseph Story. So anyway, the point is that the right to keep in bear arms has no real meaning or protection for our liberties as Americans or as humans, frankly, if we are prevented from using these to thwart tyranny in all its forms. And tyranny could be everything from a tyrannical government. It could be a street criminal. It could be a terrorist. It could be a gang. It could be uh, uh, anyone that is violently threatened. It could be an animal attack, by right? Any of these things could constitute you're in all of a sudden find yourself in a state of war and thus you have the right to defend yourself, whether it be against a foreign invading army or any of these things are a form of tyranny. And that's why the Second Amendment exists. So I go back to the how we're allowed to use or how what what how the Second Amendment allows us to use these weapons is very important. So for example, could the state of New York pass a law that says you simply cannot, you can have guns, you can keep all the guns you want, but you're not allowed to use guns in self-defense. So if someone tries to murder you and your family, you simply can't shoot a gun. Now you may say to me, that would be absurd, Mark, that would never occur. Well, obviously in the last 10 years, given how the left has behaved in the United States, it's very difficult for me to ever say that can never happen here, given the fact that they're replacing Americans nonstop with people that are not Americans with all sorts of traditions and values that may or may not be consistent with what the Constitution represents in the American form of government of self government and so on. But set that issue aside, it is pretty clear that there's a whole bunch of people out there, either by virtue of their anti-American liberal education and woke universities and schools or otherwise that may not have the same view and respect for the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, including, of course, the Second Amendment. So with all that said, uh, keep in mind that historically, the great, the British, the English had a right to keep in arms. In fact, our Second Amendment derives largely from the English Declaration of Rights in 1689, uh, the right to keep and bear arms for Protestants. A lot of that stuff came over here to the United States before it was the United States, and we used that to create the Second Amendment. Now, the reason why I bring this up is today, as we live and breathe here in the United States, over in the United Kingdom, 
freedom, even if you're allowed to have guns for hunting or skeet shooting or anything like that, guess what? You're not legally allowed to use firearms in the United Kingdom for self-defense, period, full stop. So it is not unprecedented for Western countries, uh, not America, thank God, but for some Western countries to say, even if you have a gun in your possession, you're not allowed to use it for self-defense against people to protect yourself or your family. So I bring this up now because nothing would prevent, well, I mean, the Constitution would prevent this. I think there's other reasons that would would thwart this. But to me, I think that the anti-gunners would love to find a way to say, okay, well, you can have your guns, but you simply cannot use it for any form of self-defense. You can use it for skeet shooting. You can go hunting with a license, but you can't use it for self-defense. That is the other next step, the next uh, iteration of where the anti-gun lobby wants to go. And I do study the anti-gun lobby quite carefully. I wrote, of course, I think a major book on this topic, uh, which, of course, was First, they came for the gun owners, where I lay out the entire battle plan of the left as to how they intend to take away our guns. I put that together several years ago. So again, you can see how one of the things they want to do is to make it hard to use, effectuate your right to self-defense with guns, which is why if you're in a terrible anti-gun jurisdiction like New York, New Jersey, or California, and you use your firearm rights to protect yourself and your family or your community, you know, you're just as likely to be indicted by those nutty district attorneys as a uh, as opposed to being lauded for, you know, protecting civilization in your community. Uh, that's how those uh, jurisdictions have now gone just intellectually and morally and otherwise back backwards. But anyway, so again, to sum it up, the way to think about these various buckets is you have the whether I have the right bucket, which was already resolved in Heller and McDonald, the where I can exercise the right to keep arms, which is the, you know, Heller inside the home, Bruin outside the home, sensitive places and asterisks that's being fought. Then there's the what I have the right to keep and bear arms with. That is obviously any bearable arm, any arm offensively or defensively that can be used that way is a protected arm. Then there's the who uh, has the right to keep and bear arms. That is all the people, but there's some historical debate about whether or not a people like Rahimi or Range can be disarmed based on criminal convictions. And that's what the Range and Rahimi cases are. They address the who question. And then of course the how you can use these arms for lawful purposes, which obviously should include and does include constitutionally the right to keep and bear arms for self-defense against all forms of tyranny. And that's how to think about these various things. So when you listen to my videos and you look at my writings and you hear what I'm saying, in your mind, you may want to consider how you place each video or each discussion into these various buckets that may help you organize this very complicated area of law, the Second Amendment. It's really not that complicated, by the way, but the left tries to make it complicated. And hopefully this will help you uh, stay informed and again, uh, keep everything organized in your mind. So not only you may are the smartest person in the room, but you can start being a force multiplier and teaching other people how to think about this fundamental right to keep and bear arms, uh, the palladium, of a free republic as set forth by the United States Supreme Court Joseph Story. All right, folks, hope you learned something here today at the Four Boxes Diner. Make sure you subscribe on uh, here and resubscribe. Don't forget to follow me at X at Four Boxes Diner, and we will see you again soon. Yes, indeed, here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.